Kathleen Pasiga is our afternoon presenter. She is an assistant professor at Columbia College, Chicago. Dr. Pasiga's research interests and background are specialized in the fields of early literacy and technology for literacy. Her areas of emphasis are on comprehension development and assessment, digital storybooks, and the integration of technology for literacy into schools. She currently serves on the International Reading Association as a member of the Early Literacy Task Force and the National Association for the Education of Young Children's Technology and Young Children Interest Forum as a website advisor. Please welcome to the uh, podium, Dr. Pasiga. Hi, everybody. Um, we mentioned that Meg has some handouts um, coming around. Admittedly, it's not much. Um, I did this presentation on Prezi thinking, oh wow, this will be great, I can just share an online link. And I, when I went to share it with some of the conference organizers, realized that they changed their sharing um, criteria, you know, their sharing policy, and only certain people with certain kinds of, of accounts could share their links. So what I did was I took a screencast of this Prezi, and on the handout, there's a link to my blog. On the, on the page of the blog that you're linked to, um, there's a link for this Prezi. So if you need to go back to it, it's there. Um, I used to teach kindergarten, and so um, I very much am an elementary person. Um, and I just finished up um, at Purdue's campus in Hammond, and I'm tr transitioning to a job at Columbia. When I was at um, Purdue, I taught the children's literature class. Um, and so a lot of what I'm showing today emanates from my work with um, undergrad students in the children's literature class and things that they've tried out in the elementary schools for their practicum placements. Um, I did my research on ebooks with preschoolers looking at whether or not they actually comprehend what they're um, viewing and hearing when they're engaged in um, what I call interactive ebooks. So where it kind of is like a cartoon in the book reads to you, but the print is tracked in it. Um, and what I found was remarkably poor comprehension. Um, and so I've, you know, in a roundabout way, come to advocate that ebooks are not just tools to give kids and let them run with. We really need to um, teach them how to read the texts that are on screen as well. Um, this morning, I know Julie Poirot spoke with you guys about new literacy, and she spoke about searching and an analyzing and all of those components of her perspective of new literacy. But there's one more that I'm going to sort of hone into today, and that's Dyxis, that it's constantly changing. When you, when you give kids a screen, they have to be able to modify their strategies, right? Because the con the the technology changes very rapidly. So when kids engage in reading a printed text, it's a very different experience than when they engage in reading an ebook, right? Um, so how can ebooks help? Before we start um, and really get in, on the back of your handout, I want you to take a moment to reflect about your experiences with ebooks as a teacher and as an adult reader. Um, and just um, take a minute and note whether you uh, strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree with these four items. Whether you personally read with an e-reader in your own free time, um, whether you can see yourself teaching with e-books in your classroom, whether you think that e-books make vocabulary learning easier, and whether um, a, a response to ebook looks, feels, and sounds different than response to printed materials. So go ahead and take a couple minutes, make a couple notes about why you think so, and then I'm going to pick up.
If you need a couple more moments, raise your hand. Okay. Um, so I have these four thinking points up there. And part of the research with technology integration, I'm sure somebody spoke with you about, is that teacher belief um, and competency pay, play a large role in what teachers are willing to give a try to in their own classrooms. So if you don't read on an electronic device yourself, you're less likely to try them out in your own room. Um, if you can't see yourself teaching with these things, same, same, case, same story. Um, and then there's a th th number three and four are sort of my teaching points today. Um, so what I have is sort of a, a photo story about how eBooks can help. They can help meet the needs of the Common Core Standard, um, and they can help prepare your students to engage in 21st century literacy. Um, and oftentimes when I talk about technology integration, the, the kickback that I get is, it's not the magic bullet. Technology is not the magic bullet. And I, I very wholeheartedly agree with that. It's a tool. It's a tool that you can overlay onto good teaching. Um, so I've prepared a little bit of a photo story today of um, some ways that ebooks can help with the different components of the Common Core. So in, re in foundational skills, I'm going to talk specifically about print tracking and fluency. Um, e many ebooks have print tracking features. There is very conclusive evidence that, like when you do a shared book, big book reading, and you're tracking the print for students. These features also help um, young students develop concepts about print. Um, the picture on the left is from One More Story. Um, and they track word by word. So every new word that's read, it changes one to one. And you can click the, the, the speaker over here. And it will read the whole page to them. Um, this images from Tumble Books. Um, do any of your schools subscribe to Tumble Books? Okay. So they track by the phrase. So it, it is more designed for people that have already developed some print awareness. Um, in addition, ebooks also have built-in supports for fluency. Um, if you teach English language learners, um, it helps support comprehension and meaning. Um, by offering many ebook apps, um, offer multiple languages, so it can help build comprehension that way. And then they can listen to sort of like an assisted read um, and listen to and learn the new vocabulary in English once they understand in their native language. Um, some ebook applications also offer the um, recording option, so students can actually read aloud, the iPad can record them reading aloud, and you can use it as a fluency center, and then, there, then you can, the teacher or a peer can go back and, and evaluate their oral reading um, that way. Um, some school districts have switched to e-curriculum. Um, e so this is Discovery Science. Um, and online, when you read the text, you can highlight a section and it will read it aloud for them. Um, what the research shows is that oftentimes students' oral vocabulary is much stronger than their reading vocabulary. Um, and so sometimes when you, they listen to the text before they read it, it becomes more comprehensible for them. Um, in terms of language, I, I've seen my um, student teachers use ebooks um, to promote vocabulary acquisition and knowledge of language in general. Um, I'm going to use this example of um, the fa fantastic undersea voyage of Jacques Cousteau. Does anyone know this book? It's relatively new. But in here, there's a bunch of quotes from Jacques Cousteau on each page. And um, one of them ends with this sentence, buoyed by water, he can fly. So we had a, a good conversation about what that meant. Um, and we used a Kindle application to sort of document our thinking about how, to, how do we find evidence 
for our rationalization of what that phrase meant. So in the Kindle app, which can be used on any device or it can be used on a desktop computer, so if you don't have one-to-one -one or you don't have a set of iPads or, or Kindle Fires or anything like that, you can um, just do it on your computer. Um, th we talked about using the embedded online dictionaries. Um, when you teach with printed text, they have to go and find the dictionary. They have to know how to index and look up the words. This is, is more immediate for them. Um, and so oftentimes, um, I haven't been able to find research on this, but I anticipate that they would use it more frequently because it's a lot less trouble. How many of you agree with that statement? Okay, so that's one thing. Um, when I read this definition to my students, they um, sort of were like, well, that's not quite the right definition, we don't think, because they had read it once through. And so we um, looked a little bit deeper and opened up that definition box a little bit more, which on a regular dictionary, it's all there. You don't have to know to expand the box and look further. Um, so we found here, uh, this other definition of buoy, to cause to become cheerful or confident. And my students on their Kindles noted that um, they predict that this was the definition that um, Jacques Cousteau was referring to when he used um, that statement, buoyed by water, he could fly. Later on, they went through the book and were finding evidence to support that prediction. So here, um, they found he discovered that he loved the water, um, and they wrote, if he loved the water, then he might uh, feel lifted up when he's in it, or as if he could fly. So that was their um, explanation for their argument. Um, and then they also identified this statement um, they're talking about how before Cousteau created the aqua lung, it was like a hose connected to a breathing machine on a, on a ship. And so when he was using that device to, to investigate underwater, he felt tethered um, to the boat. He could not fly. He was not free. So they, not they noted here, if you're tethered or tied up, you can't fly. Um, and oftentimes in early literacy, we do these things with just post-it notes in books, right? So this isn't dramatically different. It's just um, documenting things in a different way. Um, here there's a quote that says, I flew without wings. Now, kindergartners did not write this. This was, <laughs> this was undergraduate students, but I'm using it as an example because sometimes um, when you see how adults think about it, you can break it down more. And you could do something like this with a second grader um, where you can talk about wings and how wings of an airplane and, and, and embed science into that. But um, my undergrad students were pointing out that anatomically you need wings to fly and humans can't do that because we don't have wings, of course. Um, but when he was able to um, carry the oxygen tank on his back, he felt free like he could fly, um, so he was not tethered anymore, and so he was uplifted and buoyed by the water as if he could fly. Um, then what we, what we tried out doing was um, taking screenshots uh, on the Kindle of their um, highlights so that in one place in an email they would send to me I had all of their notes and their highlighting so that it was really easy for me to assess whether or not they could create that argument. Um, I'm going to take questions at the end, so if you have them, just jot them down, and I'm going to come back to this Kindle example in a minute. But here, what I hope that you gather is that the vocabulary, figuring out what words mean, is pretty easy when you use an e-reader device, um, and that it's not all that complicated to gather um, evidence of children's ability to, to argue a point in a, in a piece of literature. Um, the next thing that I'm going to talk about is the reading standards. Um, 
reading electronic multimodal text is different. And Julie Coyro spoke a lot this morning about that. But you have to be able to meet all the reading standards with digital text too. Um, one thing can sort of trip students up is that the text formatting can interfere with understanding key ideas. So in the text here, um, here's the, 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 the printed text version of this. Okay, it's one page and it shows the image and the words of the paragraph are all on the bottom. There's, um, so the image is smaller and, and the formatting is different. But on an e-reader, Students are allowed to change the font size, make it bigger or smaller. And what happens is that it's called reflowable text. So the images aren't anchored in a specific place on an e-reader. So if you increase the text size, sometimes, let me go back here, the image is, is helping students understand what a leafy sea dragon is here. But when you increase the text size, that part of the text is no longer anchored with the image. Mm, right? So if you're reading text and students, young readers do better with bigger words, right? If you change the text size, you're gonna have to do some talking through and thinking about, well, does this image go with this set of words? Um, in addition, you can teach students how to use the search features in a Kindle or in an iBook. Um, it can be incredibly helpful to um, help students draw conclusions about theme. So here, I, we were reading the book Wonder. Do you guys know that one? Yeah, it's a really good book. Um, anyway, we were trying to figure out the ways in which the author conveys the hurt that the main character feels. <laughs> So we started to brainstorm how we could easily figure that out. And they were like, well, let's use the search function and search for the word hurt. So in one quick quick uh, flick, you get all of those examples of where the word hurt was used. When we were done with that, we brainstormed synonyms, other words that might have appeared that would help convey how the author was letting us know that this little boy was hurt or that people around him felt hurt or discouraged or disappointed. So those were some of the other words. And then what they were able to do was to write an argument saying this is how the author, you know, I think the, the main theme of this book was hurt and this is how the author conveyed that to us. Um, one of, the, one of the biggest topics of conversation that, that I always got was, well, if you're using ebooks, does your response, the, the responses you're soliciting from your students, do they have to be different? And I argued sometimes yes and sometimes no. Um, so here is a website um, from a, um, he's in second grade, but he's a very um, published, teacher, he, he's had several articles in the reading teacher, Mr. Young, um, and he speaks mostly about fluency, but he uses um, Google Docs, a Google form, as a way for kids to log their reading experiences. So they could log ebook reading experiences or traditional printed book, and then they have to pick um, a response format. So that he has questions on synthesis, and he has questions on knowledge and analysis, and um, his students enter their reading logs that way. Um, and you can easily do that with an ebook as well. Now, this website was created prior to the Common Core, so some of the questions that are on there may not meet all of the, the standards for the Common Core, specifically argumentation um, in citing evidence. Um, in my quick you know, pass through, those were the two gaps that I noticed, but it's a very easy way to layer that on. Um, and in addition, uh, Read, Write, Think. You guys know Read, Write, Think? IRA's Clearinghouse for Lessons. They just um, released the, the app called Trading Cards, 
it's free and um, students can create um, trading cards for, for places, facts, real people, fictional people, and it takes them through and, and prompts students um, and asks them guiding questions to help them com um, complete trading cards. And so again, you can use similar response formats. Um, it doesn't have to be specifically related to ebook content. Um, it, it, I argue that we should always be making students be good thinkers about text. And so if they're reading an ebook, it should, it's not really different than reading um, a printed book in terms of what they should be able to pull out of it. Um, the ways in which they access that information is a little bit different. Um, Ebooks can also be useful in terms of speaking and listening. Um, what I what I want to show here is um, it's not an ebook. We read Fever as an ebook, and then we used Blogster sort of in a literature circle setting to do the the role of literary luminary. How how many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, so literary luminary pulled inspirational quotes, things that had real good meaning to them, and they pull, pull the quotes out and then they ask a discussion question about that particular um, quote. And so in this story, um, Maddie is the protagonist and her and her grandfather um, are moving away from Philadelphia during the time of the yellow fever, and they're not allowed to pass through. Um, because her grandfather was sick with, and, and they didn't know that he had contracted the yellow fever at that point. So um, the guard who's you know, blocking the road said, take this man back to the city. He's infected with the disease. And one of our students asked, how would the story be different if Maddie and her grandfather were let through the checkpoint? Um, and then we engaged in an online discussion about it, and I know that print is really small. But basically, um, there's four students in here that are talking in a, um, a, a threaded discussion board. Um, and one of the things that comes up is, well, if he uh, had been sick, they said, well, he wasn't sick, so he, he, w he didn't have the yellow fever, so he would have um, been okay had they not had to stay in the town with the yellow fever. Um, and somebody pointed out that there's an incubation time and the, the mosquito bite. And so we engaged in this very traditional um, discussion, but about an ebook. Um, another example is using this discovery science curriculum, which was the online text that I showed earlier. Um, these kindergartners were researching um, conservation for Earth Day. They used the digital text, they projected it up on the computer, um, on the screen, sort of on a computer on wheels. Um, and they read the digital text and they did some research with supplemental trade books and ebooks. And then they created this YouTube um, sort of propaganda video to teach their community about how to conserve for Earth Day. Um, Another example of using that fever book is using this tool called Poplet. Do, do any of you know this tool? It's really fun, it's one of my favorite tools. It's um, like inspiration in that you create diagrams, but what we did here was we identified, the students identified vocabulary that they found challenging or important. This one is, is um, for important vocabulary. And so they identified one, two, three, four, five, six or seven vocabulary words and um, put an image up there and worked collaboratively to identify why is it important, what's the synonym, and presented that um, to their students in their group. Um, here is an example of a presentation of, similar to the example with wonder, with the example of hurt, Somebody identified a theme in um, The Miraculous Journey of Edru Edward Tulane to be hopelessness. And so this is a, it, their presentation of using that search function to present their, their identification of theme and 
um, argue why they thought hopelessness was a theme using Coplet. Um, in terms of writing, um, at the elementary level, I think the biggest thing is that um, you can make ebooks with your students and share them out with a wider audience. It um, helps students become familiar with, well, how do I get an image into my, my ebook? Um, what are the different things that I, that I can do to convey my meaning? Um, and there are many different platforms to use to create your own ebooks. Um, if you have anything like iPads in your classroom, you can import images all together into them. The other thing that is useful in terms of writing is online ebooks can be organized into resources and students can engage in online reading at the, the ebook center. Um, one tool that um, Matt Gomez, who's um, a colleague that I know from some work that I do, I've done, he uses an um, interface called Symbaloo to organize his online resources that he wants his students to read. Um, they go in and they read and they find evidence to answer their research questions. So one of the questions that they, the students had asked were what is spider webs made out of? He taught the students how to take screenshots from the websites and embed them into um, a, an app called Show Me. And then they discussed what from this image and text led them to draw their conclusion. Um, this is not an ebook per se, but it's a text that students made traditionally that the teacher used a video camera to record it and had the students read aloud their text and then they shared it out on a blog with parents. Um, so another way to increase the motivation um, for students to share their text out with a wider audience. Um, and this teacher has done blogs for a couple years now and I've been following them. Sometimes um, students get comments from other people in their schools, sometimes parents, sometimes other people um, that the teacher himself is connected with on uh, personal learning networks like Twitter. He would share their blog, their blog posts on Twitter and random people that follow him would log in. I was one of them, that's how I found him. And um, I logged in and I made a comment on some of the students. So increasing the potential for audience is, is really a benefit of making these kinds of eBooks. Um, VoiceThread is another tool or platform that, that students use to create eBooks. This one is the, the culmination of a, a research paper on Abraham Lincoln. Um, and it's put out there and, and people from around the world comment on, on their students' writing. Um, that's all th of the, the photo story stuff that I have. I'm gonna open it up for questions if you want more information about any of the specific examples that I have. Feel free to raise your hand um, or you can discuss in your groups first if nobody has specific questions. Yeah, over here. I see your hand sort of going up. That was done. Um, that was done with just a Kindle application. Um, I we were using a computer, a desktop computer, um, not even an iPad, um, and they. This one, you mean? Right. So um, Kindle and Nook um, have desktop applications. So any book that you purchase through um, Barnes and Noble Nook or through Amazon Kindle, you can access from a desktop computer. Um, and kids can read those things on their desktop or laptop or iPads or Kindle or Nook or whatever. And the way that we organized this was um, a lot of the feedback that we get is, well, don't you need an email account? And kindergartners don't have email accounts. How many of you guys were thinking that same exact thing? Nobody? <laughs> well, what we did was we created um, a generic email account using Google, you know, student one with the school name. 
and then we um, had them log into their Kindle using that. Um, but schools that have one-to-one -one usually have a system for how to, get, how to push Kindle books and Kindle titles to students. Okay, so, okay. So you're asking how do how do you get from from the user interface with the student to, to submit it to the teacher? Okay, so you can teach them how to do a screenshot, which is really I mean you can project it on your teacher station, have the kids there, and you know show them the buttons that you're using on an iPad. It's the home button and the power button, and it goes into your photo roll, and then you just have them either email that or they can put it into something else to talk about it, right? And it does require, I mean, if you're talking kindergarten for second graders, it does require some of that whole group modeling and explaining, well, now, I'm gonna, now we're gonna do this and I'm gonna show you how to do this. But you would be surprised how quickly, I have a three-year-old at home who can email stuff to grandma that she makes. So, um, especially if you have your contacts, like your email sent to teacher address in your contacts on your iPad devices. Yeah. So, PowerPoint is one way that they can do it. Um, but I showed VoiceThread, which is basically, um, it's kind of like YouTube meets PowerPoint. Um, and I showed, that was the one with Abraham Lincoln that I had showed. Um, and I will, let's see. One of my favorite ones that I always show people um, when I am teaching is this little boy's writing about, um, he was one of those little boys who was into um, superheroes. And um, he, let's see if I can find it. Here, Jack's Monster Cards. Um, he drew all of these online, or on paper, took images of them, uploaded them. This monster is really cool. And presented them to a wider audience. This, this monster's said. name is Robot Man. One of his attacks is Snap. That attack does 80 damage. Sidekick does 90 damage. And he was the first monster ever to battle in the war against the alien lizards. And so he's got this whole series of these it's a kind of like Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon cards that he's created. And all these yeah, different people around team. the world have read his work and have left comments on it. Um, and the comments that people can leave can even... Jack, this is one of my favorite cards because he's the god of the first Dragon King. So you could build in sort of peer feedback into, um, well, why don't you log into Jack's... Uh, voice thread and tell him about your favorite one that he made and tell him why and so building that sort of um, then they don't all have to be in the same place at the same time it's sort of an electronic trace that you can embed into your classroom and when they go to the computer station there's something meaningful to engage in um, I just finished a synthesis of research that shows that um, the bulk majority of computer use in primary grades in early childhood is used for drill and kill. So they're playing jumpstart um, games, they're answering math facts. They're not using the technology authentically as adult users would use them. So I always advocate for elementary teachers to figure out what are some really authentic ways that we can use the technology. Because that's when it's, it becomes worthwhile and it becomes sort of seamlessly integrated into your classroom. Yeah, way in the back. Yes, yes. 
so schools that, that buy into these free, um, you know, publicly available, they sign waivers. It becomes part of their school's accessible use policy. Um, I've seen people work around it where they use like the, the green eyeball images where their, their, their child's image is secured. Um, and that's, you know, sort of when there, there is that element, NAEYC, the National Association for the Education of Young Children just released a position statement. And online security and privacy is a big threat in that. And as elementary teachers, when we're using this, we sort of need to make students aware. Um, there's a classroom, Matt Gomez's classroom actually has a Twitter account, a classroom Twitter account. And they you know, t do the weather with the, the local news weather guy through Twitter. And they sort of did a whole investigation with that. Um, and so they were creating social awareness and, and, and awareness of privacy and who do, we, who do we let be our friend on Twitter versus not and how do we make those decisions. Not related to ebooks per se, but it's, a, it's another authentic integration of technology. Other sorts of questions? Want to know more about anything in particular? In, in, so one of the one of the big things that I do with younger students, I put my iPad in a document projector, a doc camera, and we read the ebooks together. I read them aloud. I control the pacing. So it, it, when students use them independently, they often use the read to me function. Um, but I use it as a whole group read aloud sometimes. Um, and I you know, talk through how do we navigate this text and what if we want to go back to a specific page and we pull the table of contents out from the side and we go back to that page to elaborate on a, on a comprehension discussion question. Um, and so I help students sort of navigate that technology because one of the things that I found in my dissertation research was the kids who couldn't do the navigation didn't co comprehend even less than the students who were able to work the mouse and knew how to work the devices. So there's that, there's that layer of sort of technological fluency that can sort of interfere with the actual comprehension of the text. So I use ebooks as a read aloud. Um, and I talk about how do we use the dictionary feature and all that kind of stuff with them. Um, that's, that's one thing that we do. Um, there are a whole slew of them, and that, that link that I gave you on the handout, there is um, a link to my, my um, blog page, and I'll pull that up for you. And I have sort of here a whole slew of resources. Um, I have links to um, Tumble Books and Book Flicks um, and One More Story. Um, and then there's these review websites that sort of help you identify titles that could be able to use. Digital Storytime uh, um, has an index of free iPad applications and Kindle applications that are eBooks. Um, so those are the, the resources I use. When you get up three through five, Project Gutenberg has a lot of the um, classics. Um, there's Wind in the Willows is there for free. Um, we Novel is another one I think that I have on here. You can get Charlotte's Web, um, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Some, some of the older classics are, are, are really available on there. Um, and so I've shared this with you, and down at the bottom is a link to that Prezi if you sort of want to go back, and if you're a visual person, and you're like, what was that one thing that she showed? The link is there. Um, there's some you know, examples of uh, schools, Burley School is in Chicago, where they have one-to-one um, -one 
um, in elementary grades. And if you're a researchy person and you like to read the research, there's some research there. But ebooks have conclusively improved students' vocabulary when they're well designed to support vocabulary. Um, the argument is that the animation and the images um, sort of help bring to life. One of the examples is um, if you think about the children's picture book, Stella Luna, there's a part when she falls down from the attack from the bird at the beginning and she gets caught up in a thicket and she's hanging on by her, her little claws there um, upside down and the text says she quit, trembled in with fear. And the image in the ebook version of that book, they like used a grab function in the animation studio and they moved Stella Luna back and forth. So if you ask students after they've watched that sort of uh, you know, animated version, archaically animated version, um, versus the printed version, you'd find that they understood a little bit more about what the word trembled meant because they were able to see it come to life a little bit more. The, the tricky part about learning storybook language is that it's, they use he said, she said. When you start to animate things, those, those abstract markers become more alive. When somebody you know, said, oh, I walked to the store with my mom, and the, per the character in the book is saying it, it sort of helps them connect who is saying that. Um, and so those are some of the Kindle books that you can do on, an, on a desktop don't have that interactivity and animation embed embedded in them. Um, but then there's a flip side argument to that too, is we're not really teaching them how to read. So there's, there's both sides of the argument. But when used strategically, they can help. I mean, if you think about how kids learn how to read emergent reading, you read the book over and over and over and over again, and eventually they start to memorize it. And eventually then they start to recognize some of the words, right? Preschool, kindergarten, first grade emergent readers, that's how they learn how to read. Well, the same case could be made for learning how to read and using that interactive ebook as a stepping stone and an another additional experience with the text. Um, if there aren't any more questions, I think that's all I have. Give a round of applause, please. Thanks. And there were several of you who were asking who didn't get copies. We have more copies made, so if you didn't get a handout, please come see us in a minute. And we will take a break, and we come back into our uh, inquiry groups at 2 o'clock. And we have some discussion protocols for that and then the giveaway shortly thereafter.